Welcome to the study of God's Word, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. And at this time, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, if you would. Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be in uh, chapter 14 tonight. Verses 3 through 9. You'll see on the screen here that there are two other references along with this because they're parallel references, although they bring out a few other things that are important. And we'll refer to them as we're going through um, this special section. It's the dinner where Mary of Bethany broke open the alabaster flask and poured the ointment upon Jesus. And there are so many lessons within this section that I wanted to go a bit slower through it and not just get a basic understanding, but also pull some uh, connections between our life right now and the Lord Jesus. You know, as we, as we look at the scripture, we want to ask ourselves, who's here? Who's being talked about? Where are they? What's happening around them? You ask different questions of the scripture as you're reading. I like to do that because it starts filling in a bit of the backstory. Now, it's the first century, and, and we can't even imagine, other than watching the movie The Chosen or something, we can't even imagine what life was like then. But also, in this particular section, if we had a scratch and sniff Bible where we could scratch the text and then kind of get an idea of what was going on, I believe this dinner was a, a time of heaviness and not a time of super joy because it's during that last time in Jerusalem and just in a few days, Jesus is going to be betrayed and apprehended and crucified. And Satan was right there ready to move Judas to do the deed. And so there must have been a, a heaviness in the whole room. The text doesn't talk about heaviness, but just looking at the time that's going on, we can think, you know, there must have been a, a, just a sense of oppression in that time. But it's interesting that as Mary poured out the ointment on Jesus, Jesus said, she has done a good deed. She has done what she could. Mary didn't have a lot of resources, but she took what she had and she poured it upon Jesus. And each of us tonight are to examine our own hearts before the Lord and ask ourselves, really, have I done what I could with what I have and who I am? Not what haven't I done, but have I done what the Lord has put in my hands to do? Maybe the talent or the gifting or even the resources. And so we're going to take the text tonight in this short study, and we're going to look at, uh, number one, the deed of Mary of Bethany, and that's in verse three. Number two, the disdain of Judas Iscariot and the disciples in verses four and five. And then number three, the discernment of Jesus in this whole thing in verses six through nine. So follow along with me. I'm going to read through our text and then we'll start with a word of prayer. Starting in Mark chapter 14, verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves, and they said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? for it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. 
Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Father in heaven, we're asking for your ministry to our hearts by the Holy Spirit this evening. You know what's going on in our life. You know what we've been through. You know what we're dealing with right now. And you also know what lies ahead in the future. And you are a God of compassion and comfort and power. And we're asking that you would minister to us from this text this evening. And Lord, help us to know where we need to break our flask and pour out our heart upon the Lord. And so be with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take a look at the dinner, first of all, the deed of Mary of Bethany. We know from John's gospel that the woman spoken of here in the text was Mary of Bethany. Now, I know in the gospel accounts, there, is, there seems to be an adjustment of time as you compare the three gospel accounts. Matthew and Mark are very similar, and then John is written traditionally at the end of the first century. And John is reflecting back. The Gospel of John is a little more uh, chronological than Matthew or Mark because Matthew and Mark are, um, they're generally chronological, but they center more on themes as they're going. But in the Gospel of John, we are told that it was six days before Passover, which would have made this Friday night, which is Shabbat. It's the Shabbat dinner. And so they're in the house of Simon, uh, the leper. Of course, he wasn't a leper then because he wouldn't have been in the house. He'd been out uh, outside the town. But uh, um, most Bible commentators believe that Jesus at one point had actually healed him. And now he had come back into the small village. And, um, you know, it was a thing of, of honor and rejoicing to have the Lord Jesus in his house. But Mary and Martha and Lazarus, were there with the Shabbat dinner. And of course, Martha was serving. That was her gifting. And that wasn't um, put down by Jesus at all. But it was Mary that had this foreboding sense of what was coming. All the words that were spoken in Jerusalem by the Jewish authorities, threatening to throw people out of the synagogue and and excommunicate them from the society in that community for believing that Jesus was the Messiah. And then they were looking, the Jewish authorities were looking for a way to catch Jesus and to put him to death because they felt like he was a blasphemous and proclaiming himself to be the Son of God. The Gospel of John tells us that clearly. People knew what was going on, and yet Jesus was boldly going into the temple, and he was was teaching, and nobody was laying a hand on him, and he he was shutting down the authorities that were trying to trap him in his words. And so there's this sense at this dinner, here's Jesus and his disciples, the 12, including Judas, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and possibly Simon the leper, it's his home, Martha is serving. It's a big deal. And then Mary has this overwhelming sense where, according to Matthew and Mark, she pours this ointment on Jesus' head. And then you look at the Gospel of John and it emphasizes the fact that that she dumped out that oil on his feet. Now, remember... In the first century here, their normal custom of eating around the table is something that would be interesting for Thanksgiving, I think. They had a table that was quite low, and they had benches around the table. 
and you would recline facing the table, leaning on your left arm, and you'd use your right arm to, to do the eating. And so your feet were sticking out, and you were facing the table. Now try that during Thanksgiving meal this time. See how that works. I mean, I'm sure the kids would love it. But here, it's interesting that Mary took the flask of oil and she broke it. Now, some Bible commentators say that she just broke the seal. But an alabaster flax is, is almost like a, an opaque glass. And, and it comes at a, at a slender top. And it and ends up with a little kind of a rosebud thing. And, and it says that she broke it. Now, what was she doing with this? Now, think about it. What perfume costs a year's wage? Because 300 denarii are 300 days wage. What perfume today is so precious that it costs a year's wage? What is she doing with this? And by the way, this spikenard came from India. This, um, many Bible commentators believe, was ointment that was reserved for her future wedding, her future wedding night. But she took what was most precious to her, knowing that Jesus' death was coming, that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. She didn't use any water or any common olive oil. She had to use something that was most precious because it represented her. And, and it's important to see that this fragrant oil was a representation of Mary's heart. She took and she, she broke open the top and she poured it on Jesus' head as the anointed one. That's what the word Messiah means. But then overwhelmed with the reality of what was going down, she went down to his feet and she poured out the remaining part of the oil on his feet. And then it says she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, normally the hair was put up in these days, but then she didn't bring a towel with her because I don't think it was her first uh, thought to anoint his feet. So she anointed his head, but then his feet, this how precious are you know, the feet of those who bring good news. She poured it out and she wiped his feet with her hair. And in effect, even though that fragrance filled the house, she took upon herself the fragrance of Jesus in her hair. This is an amazing deed, a deed that she did. She took what was most precious to her and she poured it out on Jesus. And once the alabaster flax was broken, it couldn't be used anymore. In a sense, it was taking your future and completely putting it on Jesus. I get concerned about my future. Uh, the older I get, the future comes faster. And the Lord just keeps telling me, it's none of your business. Your future's in, in my hands. I'll take care of it. But what's important is today, give me your heart, Bob. Pour it out. Take your future and, and give it to me and let go. I'll take care of it. And I'll be there on a particular day to help you know what to do, when to do it, how to do it. But just keep your focus on me. You know what's amazing about Mary of Bethany? Every time she occurs in the scriptures, she's at Jesus' feet. The first time you see her at Jesus' feet is there in Luke chapter 10, verse 42. And she's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his word. The second time we see her at Jesus' feet was there when her brother Lazarus died. Four days earlier, she was crushed. And Jesus came nearby. She went out to see Jesus, and she fell at his feet, weeping. 
If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She believed that Jesus was the Messiah and they had the power to heal sickness. But her faith hadn't come to the level that he could raise somebody from the dead, especially her brother who was now four days and uh, corrupting. And now we see her at Jesus' feet for the third time. Anointing his feet with this precious ointment of a year's wage. And it says it filled the house. Now the houses were small back then. And, and, you know, I know what it's like riding on trains in England. And all of a sudden, a couple of blokes come in and they've poured a couple of bottles of cologne on themselves. And, you know, and it fills the whole carriage. Now, I have a problem with colognes because I'm 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 allergic. All of a sudden, my nose starts running. My eyes start watering. My throat closes up. I remember one time we had this guest speaker speak at our church in Phoenix, and he was a big guy. And I had a little Volkswagen rabbit. And so I had to take him from our house over to the church. And to get in, he had to put the back of the seat almost all the way in because he was so large. And he must have poured a half a bottle of something on himself, and it filled the car. And, and I can barely breathe. I've got the window rolled down. It's freezing cold. I don't care. I've got the window down. because, And I don't want to embarrass him. I don't want to say anything, but I'm dying. It's just how it is. You know, I remember when I started wearing cologne. I was in the seventh grade. I didn't wear cologne before then. But in the seventh grade, all of a sudden, I'm in junior high. And there's all these cute girls. And I'm watching these. This is, by the way, 1964. And and so I'm watching these television commercials where these guys are wearing this cologne. And when they wear the cologne, all these girls just kind of hang around them. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I've got to do that. And so, um, you, you know, the boys' locker room just stunk until after all the showers were done. And then, by the way, um, I want to show you here some of the colognes we used right here. Um, this is for those of you that go way back. You remember high karate? Yeah, yeah. Or Jade East. Yes, remember that? And then, of course, English leather. Somehow that's still around. Of course, Old Spice. Um, I'm not sure why that's even around. And then, and then up there, you, you remember Avon? You know, with all the bottles? So if you're selling Avon in here, God bless you, you know, but um, let's continue on. Anyway, Mary's perfume filled the house, and it represented her worship. The Bible tells us that our prayers are like incense that goes up before the throne. How do I smell before the Lord? Is is what I'm offering to the Lord a true fragrance Or is there a hidden motive behind it? Am I wanting God to do what I want because I want it? And after all, it will will be a blessing to you eventually, but I really want that. Or is, is it from a heart that says, God, I don't want anything you don't want me to have. And I want to pour out my future on you. I want to pour out what's most precious to you. I want you to be the most important thing in my life over objects, over possessions, over positions, over people. Sometimes we go through brokenness and our future is destroyed by circumstance or by people or by our own stupidity, wrong choice. What can I do with the brokenness? Well, I would suggest in the midst of brokenness, that's when it's time to pour out your heart before Jesus. 
because he cares. Psalm 56 verse 8 says, You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? It hasn't been lost. Your grieving behind closed doors, your weeping has not been lost. It says they are in his book. You either believe it or you don't, but the Bible says so. Mary's deed is so important. She did what she could with what she had. But let's continue on. Verses 4 through 5. Verses 4 through 5 says, But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why is this fragrant oil wasted? For it could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. We know from the Gospel of John that it was Judas Iscariot who was stirring up this thought. And John points out, as he looks back on the, on the earlier years, he says he was a thief. He was, I, he was stealing what, out of the bag. He was the treasurer. Then you think, why did Jesus entrust Judas? How about Matthew? I mean, he was kind of a, a bean counter. No. For God's own purpose, the Father's own purpose, Judas was to have the bag, the treasury. Sometimes when we consider this, God allows people to have things to reveal their heart. The treasury box revealed Judas's heart. I don't want to be used by God to be a lesson for somebody else that's bad. I want to be used by God so that my life honors God. You realize that it says they criticized her sharply. They were indignant. This disdain and this criticism came from a heart of selfishness. Stirred up by Judas Iscariot because he was a thief. And he kept robbing. No wonder the disciples were poor. By the way, to say, oh man, this could have been sold and, and all the money given to the poor. And, and by the way, who's more poor than us? I mean, you know, and why were they so poor? Because Judas was swiping things out of the treasury box. And Jesus knew it, but he let it alone. Because sometimes the Lord takes off his hands and lets things reveal themselves in time. Are you concerned that people are getting away with injustice? God hasn't stepped in and stopped them. You know what? It will reveal itself in time. You realize that Judas had his own fragrance? It was the fragrance of a septic tank. And that filled the house because it affected the other disciples. And this brings to mind something that if we're walking in the Spirit, we can be a fragrance that glorifies God. But when we're in the flesh and we're walking according to the pride of life and the lust of the eye and lust of the flesh, do you know it sends the, a, a smell is called the Judas fragrance. It stinks. I remember one time being at, at a home we were staying at out in the country. And in the morning I was taking a shower and I noticed like halfway in the shower, it's like the shower was filling up and it wasn't draining and it was full of dirt. And I well, said, so I'm not that dirty. What, what's all this dirt? Well, it wasn't dirt. It was poo because it was coming up from the septic tank back into the shower. And, you know, when it's like you're standing in it, you're just going, ah, you know, how do you get clean from this? You know, what do you do? Well, that's the fragrance when we're walking in the flesh. It doesn't glorify God. It dishonors God. The Lord is a God of mercy and forgiveness. 
And he's a God that cleanses us. But just think of this. Judas's fragrance filled the house. I like what 2 Corinthians 2 verses 15 through 16 say. Paul writes, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death, leading to death. And that's when you share with someone about the Lord Jesus and they go, oh, get out of here. I don't want to hear your, your junk. That's your truth. Get out of here. It's an aroma of death to them, although it is an aroma of life leading to life to those who are being saved and who is sufficient for these things. By the way, what Mary did in, in wasting that oil was the final straw for Judas. Because it was at that point where Satan just took a hold of him and took him body, soul, and spirit, got a hold of him, and he went to make the arrangements for the betrayal. That's pretty scary because sometimes a heart that's full of judgment and criticism and a critical spirit, Satan uses that to do so much evil, even with believers. Um, We're watching it on social media. I haven't seen so much nastiness between believers on social media as I have this past four years. What's happened? You think, you think the Lord has taken a vacation and he doesn't care. How is it you can, you can speak things of God in one breath and then tell a sexual innuendo and a dirty joke and laugh with your friends? I mean, what happened to holiness? Is that the Spirit of God that's moving that? It's sin to have a critical spirit because people do things differently than you would do. I've been in countries where people are just having pure worship before the Lord, and it's in the midst of liturgy, it's in the midst of bells and smells, and, you know, I don't feel comfortable in a, in a super-structured kind of an environment like that. I have a hard time with that. I get distracted by all that. But there are people that just pour their heart to the Lord. How does Jesus see them? He sees them like Mary pouring out the oil. And am I being the one to criticize them sharply? There are others that are quite expressive in their worship. And I've been in countries where they're They're just the worship part of the service goes on for three or four hours before they even get to the Bible. It's an all-day event. And I'm thinking, you know, that's that's a little rough. I don't, you know, I'm um, when are we going to, you know, and, and I'm all wrapped up in my time. And I have criticized them sharply. I just have to let them alone. I gotta let people worship the Lord. And let God be the judge of their heart. Let's finish up here in verses 6 through 9. And we're going to see the discernment of Jesus. Verse 6, but Jesus said, let her alone. You know, this is one of the few times Jesus really rebukes his disciples. And he says, Let her alone. I don't think it was like a soft, like, well, fellas, you know, it might be good if you'd not be quite so offensive. You think that's what he said? No. I mean, this is like, he's got a few days left to live. And these guys are criticizing Mary. And Jesus just, you know, unloads on them. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? All week long, I've been hearing these two sentences. Because 
Sometimes I just try to control things. I want things to go a certain way. I want people to kind of like cooperate. And I hear this thing where the Lord is saying, let them alone. Why do you trouble them? They're doing it different than you would do. Let them alone. Give them to me. Let me take care of it. And I've seen in my own heart, and I'm just, conf- it's not a confessional booth, but I'm just sharing, you know, how the Lord is working in my life. Stop being so critical. Let the Lord see it as, let, I need to see it as the Lord sees things. Jesus wanted all future generations to understand true kingdom priorities, and that's what he says here in this section. She has done a good work for me. I know it's important to have things in savings, you know, a certain amount in savings. Oh, you got to have that because that's, you know, it has to be the base and you've got your life so structured on how everything will be safe and secure and you won't have many troubles. You'll have a buffer. Everything will be fine. But does that leave any room for the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart? to take what you had in savings and to help out the family in dire need. Oh, I can't do that because I need to have like $1,000 in savings. Wait a minute. Are you being led by budget principles or are you being led by the Holy Spirit? It's right to have, um, to have, to have a buffer. I mean, you carry a, a spare tire in your car. I mean, that's, but I'm talking about trusting in things instead of letting the Holy Spirit be the rule of your life. Letting him uh, guide you day by day and trusting him with your future. I'm not saying to empty out your bank accounts right now. I'm just saying, you know, who are we trusting in? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to be the rule? of our life. Let her alone. Why do you trouble them? She's done a good work for me. She has done what she could. No matter who we are or how old we are or what circumstances we find ourselves in, we should all do as Mary of Bethany did. Just do what we can rather than focusing on what we haven't done. So let me ask these questions in closing. What is it we have to offer to the Lord? Our talent, our time, our resources. Maybe they're not much. Maybe you're at a time right now where you just feel like you don't have much to offer at all. You're not even sure if you're going to have a Thanksgiving meal. Your family doesn't care about you. You're on your own. You're stuck in Aurora, Colorado, and you wonder how you got here. And nobody calls you. The Lord knows where you are. And really, it's just taking who you are, what you have, and, and you lay it at his feet, like Mary. And you say, you are more important than anything that I have or ever will be. And I want to pour myself out on you. How does Jesus see it? She's done a good work for me. The need is to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow Jesus, and just do what we can. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word tonight, and we're asking that you would penetrate our heart, that we would take this picture of what Mary has done that it would be a picture of ourselves before you. Father God, we confess there's so much fear in our heart. Fear of the future. Fear of losing control. Fear of not having things the way we want it. 
And we want to take all that and pour it out at your feet. We thank you, you're a God that's merciful, a God who understands, and a God of all comfort. And right now, Lord, you are hearing the hearts of so many that have been listening to this message, listening online, watching online, being here in the sanctuary, and you know it's exactly where they're at. Move upon them in your kindness. Lead us all, Lord, to repentance and deeper relationship with you. Help us to finish well before it's too late. Thank you for this text, Lord. Do your full work in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.